Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Claremont Presbyterian Church. I am Pastor Karen Sapio, and it is a delight to welcome all of you here this evening. We have been excited to provide this opportunity for our whole community and from talking to some of you as you came in, for our whole region, uh, to hear from John Pavlovitz. Some of you know him from reading his books, some of you know him from reading his blog, some of you follow him on Twitter, and some of you are just hearing about him from friends or neighbors, or in the case of our church, from some book studies we've been doing of his books. Uh, John is originally from New York State, currently lives in North Carolina. He has served as a pastor, he is also a writer, as you know, and an activist, a storyteller, and um, just a general collector of stories, is what he told us uh, at, a, at an event last night. Um, he has written several books, Stuff That Needs to Be Said, which is the title of his blog as well, Hope and Other Superpowers, A Bigger Table, and more recently, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk. We are so glad to have you here in our space. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you need the facilities while you're here, they are out in the entryway and then off to, to the right as you're heading out and to the right. And uh, after the event is over tonight, if any of you are interested in looking at some of his books, we have some available at a table on your way out. And now, uh, without further ado, I would ask you all to welcome John Pavlovitz. Hey. Well, good evening, California and elsewhere. I am so glad to be here in this room with the helpers and the lovers and the healers and the activists and the caregivers and the damn givers. If that's, if that's you tonight, just make some noise and let me hear you. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I want to begin by thanking you for making the trip here. Um, someone came up to me and she said, I drove three hours to be here. And I said, the talk is really only worth about a 90 minute drive. <clears throat> so I'll refund you the rest. Um, but it's, a, it's an honor to me that you would take time out of your lives to be here with me. And um, so I'm grateful. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I did have brain surgery uh, in October. And so anything I say tonight that's mildly incoherent or controversial, I'm going to blame on residual tumor, OK? <laughs> or amne uh, anesthesia fog, if we need that one. But I'm so glad to see you. and. Um, I want to thank Reverend Brian, Reverend Karen, and the entire staff here for being such wonderful hosts and welcoming me. You know, a lot of people say, John, I just, I'm frustrated with churches. I can't find a place in the church. Well, this is a place where you might be able to find a home. So if you ever drive by here and never came in, uh, welcome. I hope that you'll feel loved and seen and heard here, and I'll be back tomorrow morning. Um, so as Reverend Karen said, I began to think of myself over the past couple of years not as an author or a pastor or a speaker, but as a war correspondent, as sort of a collector of stories because the, the work I do, I get a profound gift. I get into a new community and I step into the trenches of life with people and I say, tell me what's happening here on the ground so I can tell the folks back home and people give me proximity to their pain. People share with me the deepest contents of their hearts and I listen to their stories and I listen for the places their voices shake. And then I try to take those stories and make some sense of them and then report those stories back to the rest of the people who read my work. And so I really wanted to begin tonight by stepping in to this uh, town, this community and ask you, What's happening here on the ground? Would you tell me either why you're here, just raise your hand, tell me why you're here, what brought you to this room, or just what life is like for you lately and what causes you to be present here tonight? Who wants to share? And I'll repeat it back after. Just put up your hand. Why are you here? Yes.
so you've been following me for years and connected to the writing, and now we get to be present in the same physical space, so I just love that. Uh, and it's really important that you understand that this is a reciprocal appreciation. It's not just me giving content out to the world and you reading it, but knowing that you read it is actually a, a, a way of encouragement to me because I'm just like you. I'm looking at the world every day thinking, what is happening here? And I'm trying to fig figure out if I can make sense of it. And so knowing that you care that much to come, that helps me a lot. So thank you. Yes, in the back. So, thank you. So you feel, yes, you feel sadness and the, and the writing might encourage you or make you feel heard and you feel less alone. And isn't that great? Because, you know, I'm always amazed that anyone actually shows up when I appear. <laughs> because it's really, it's, I understand that people are reading the blog or the books, but it's difficult to connect that data and intellectual idea to flesh and blood human beings. So when you walk into a room like this, I'm overjoyed because I thought I was going to be by myself tonight. So thank you. My writing's on grief. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Why are you here? Yes, way in the back, sir. The division. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I'm so grateful. Um, you know, when someone says, I'm looking at a man right now and I don't know what's coming and it's terrifying. So thank you, because that could have, I, I really appreciate it. And we'll talk a lot about the writing of this book, uh, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk, because it's been my journey for the past couple of years, and I hope you'll find some of your story in that. Um, so, if God is love, wait a minute, before I even say that, do you know that what's happening right now in this room really matters um, because humanity has never been arranged in this specific configuration in the history of the planet. We've never all shared the same space and time. And what that means is tonight is unprecedented. Tonight is historic. And if we do this right, it's going to alter the world outside this building. And that is what we want, right? We don't want to just have a good experience and feel connected. That's beautiful, but we want it to alter the planet. And you have already changed this gathering by your presence. So I wanted to remind you of that. There, uh, I'm going to listen for your story later, and I hope that you'll share it with me. So if God is love, don't be a jerk. So we don't necessarily in this room all agree that God is or that God is love. We don't all agree in the existence of God or if that God existed, that the character of that God is indeed love. But what if we could agree just for a little while that God definitely is and that the character of that God is absolutely love? If we could agree on that, what are the implications for the people who have faith in that God? What kind of practical response does that love require? How should that reality of a God who is loved change us? How should it change the church? How should it alter the way we spend our time and our resources? And how should it change our activism and the way that we move through this world and the way we vote? I recently re released a book called If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk. And the original title was actually Unboxing God. And in many ways, that idea is still at the heart of the book and of our time together. And I want to begin there. In the outgrowing of old things and in the uncomfortable stretching that it brings. So a while ago, I was looking through my clothes in the master bedroom closet. And I moved from the well-traveled middle section to the periphery 
You know where outfits no longer fit for human usage? They languish there in dust and darkness before being evicted into bags or boxes and placed in the garage or the attic or given to the less fortunate. And I was thumbing through a parade of once sensible and now tragically laughable fashion decisions. <laughs> and I came across an old friend. It was a pair of ladies' stretch denim pants that I had purchased for myself in 1988 at the Cherry Hill Mall in southern New Jersey. Now, a note on this. At the time, I had a long and luxurious mane of naturally curly chestnut brown hair, and I was the singer in what is now affectionately known as a hair band. So being that this was the case, it was not unusual for me to go shopping for my pants at a ladies' clothing store. And so as I stared there reverently, at this glorious acid-washed relic of my youth gone wild, a voice in my head that sounded like my own said, you know what, I bet they still fit. <laughs> like a crafty serpent tempting Adam and Eve in the garden, the voice beckoned me forward, go ahead, try them on. Now at the time, I still considered myself in fairly good shape, and so I naively asked myself, why not? I was about to find out why not. <laughs> Things started off promisingly enough. I quite easily traversed my ankles, but by the time I reached my calves, I knew I was in trouble as progress slowed considerably. <laughs> but undaunted, I doubled my resolve and pressed on, which proved to be a terrible decision. Because in a few moments, I was hopping up and down like a demented sack race participant in my closet. I was sweating, and I was heaving, and I was hoping that blunt force and gravity would force me into what had now become a pair of pale blue sausage casings. But I jumped up and down a few more times and I felt a rush of air vacuum sealing me in and I came to rest on the closet floor, perspiring but feeling very pleased with myself <laughs> until I realized three things. One, I was no longer 22 years old. Two, I still hadn't fully exhaled yet. <laughs> and three, I was not getting out of these pants by myself. They say that the first step in solving a problem is admitting that you have one. So I called out to my family, and my wife and my two children heard my muffled cries from the closet, and they probably imagined that I had had a bad fall or a heart episode, and instead find, found a grown man trapped in his own slacks. So they extricated me, and then I took the pants and put them back onto the hanger. They had returned now to their normal size. Friends, if I had expired there in that closet, it would have been listed on my death certificate as unintentional spandicide <laughs> caused by reckless arrogance. No one would have blamed the pants. They were doing what they were supposed to do. They just couldn't accommodate me 22 years and many pounds later. This has been my spiritual journey over the past decade and a half, trying desperately to cram my belief into a space that was no longer capable of fitting into, hoping that sheer will and a little denial and lots of wishful thinking would allow me to stay in something that I'd long outgrown but couldn't quite bring myself to admit didn't fit me anymore. There's a song people have sung in churches for decades Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's, it's good enough for me. Now that's far from a ringing endorsement, by the way. <laughs> if someone proposes to you and says, I want you to marry me, you're good enough for me. <laughs> Rethink that decision. But what do you do when that old time religion isn't good enough for you anymore? 
when good enough is far less than what you're seeking in the deepest recesses of your heart? What if organized religion or American Christianity or the local church that you attend doesn't seem to adequately reflect the character of a God who you imagine to be love? This is a recurring theme that we're going to go back to again and again tonight during the four hours that I'll be here sharing these words. <laughs> uh, that of, ex of expansion of making greater space in your image of God, greater space in getting better alternative stories of the world, getting new experiences of widening the territory of your understanding and of your hospitality. I don't need you to leave here tonight agreeing with my theology or my doctrine. I would like you to agree with me, because then we'll both be right, but... <laughs> I don't need you to agree with everything that I say. I don't even agree with everything I say. But I want you, friends, to be stretched from wherever you are to a place of greater empathy, to a place of greater generosity, to a place of greater courage or greater volume in a life of love, or simply a greater desire to be whatever you feel the world needs right now. See, whether you're a religious person tonight or not, you know that when someone's image of God is too small, it never results in anything good. And we see the results of undersized theology everywhere, don't we? Right now, we've seen undersized theology in responses to the pandemic. We've seen it in movements of cruelty in the name of a God of love. We've seen it in political movements that seem to leverage fear. You may have experienced this undersized theology internally. You might have begun to have a stretching as your beliefs are shifting and you feel tension between what you once believed to be true and now suspect. I call it life arguing with your theology. You have those moments when your circumstances or your experience begins to argue with whatever uh, theology you were raised in and you have the choice of leaning into that new experience or relying on the old doctrine. Or you might have experienced this undersized theology from the outside in people who claim faith yet perpetuate fear or prejudice or exclusion. You may have been injured by someone with a tiny God. And so tonight I want you to ask some questions of yourself as we begin. Where do I sense this spiritual outgrowing in me? Where do I feel the tension of new thoughts confronting old beliefs? Where do I see undersized theology in Christians or in the church? Where do I feel this expansion needs to happen in order for a God of love to be better reflected? What does a religion rooted in love actually look like in the messy trenches of my life? And what do people of faith, morality, and conscience do together in the face of hateful religion? So I wanted to rewind a little bit because the book that many of you have read is called If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk. And I started writing that book in a, a church building in Raleigh, and the church was, it was not my church, and they were just letting me use the building to write. And I started writing this book, and I had told a publisher the book that I was going to write. The way these things work is, a publisher, if you're fortunate, will say, would you like to write a book? And you say, yes, I would. And they say, what kind of book? And you have to describe in great detail the book you're going to write. So you have to determine, predict who you're going to be in a year and a half or two years. So I... I brought up the idea of this book, and they said, okay, let's write, why don't you write that book? And they leave you alone for six months, which is terrible and terrifying, right? And I'm in this room, and I begin writing this book in January of 2020. And I've got my head down, and I'm writing the book, and I start hearing about this news story of this small health crisis somewhere across the planet. And I've got my head down, and I'm writing the book, and I I, every day, I, the stories would become more prevalent, and I'm trying to write the book, but I'm paying attention to what's happening, and f the stories become more dire and more serious, and I'm still trying to write this book and yet realize what's happening in the world as even the date that I was supposed to come here two years ago was canceled. And then the year is moving on, and we're moving into the summer, and there are murders of people of color 
and there are protests demanding justice for those people, and there are counter-protests to the protesters. And I'm trying to write this book, and I'm seeing that happen, and I'm seeing this health crisis happening, and then I'm looking at the election approaching, and the rhetoric is heating up, and the anti-immigrant rhetoric, and the anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. And finally, I reached a point where I could no longer write this book because I could no longer speak to these massive issues just tangentially. I couldn't speak to them just in passing. I needed to do what I've always done, which is write ex explicitly about the moment in time that I find myself, and I couldn't do that properly. And I went to my publisher and said, I can't write this book. And they were so wonderful, they said, well, John, what book could you write? And so I went away for a couple weeks and I started thinking about the book that I could write and it was this book. Here's why this book was difficult in the midst of all of that. I realized that in the pandemic, in the resistance to safeguards and the resistance to masks, and I looked at the people who were opposing the Black Lives Matter movement, and I looked at the people who were talking about LGBTQ human beings and immigrants in destructive ways. All of these things were happening. They were being generated mostly by Christians, predominantly who were white. And I realized there's something wrong there. When the people who identify with a compassionate activist Jesus and with a God who is defined as love, when those people are perpetuating fear and bigotry, we have to stop and ask how that happened. So we'll get to the don't be a jerk part later. But the subtitle of the book is Finding a Faith That Makes Better Humans, not finding a religion that makes better humans. And that may seem like an exercise in semantics, but it's actually critical to having a life of greater empathy, to have a faith that is reflected in love, a life that has the capacity to welcome more people. And there are two problems I want us to reckon with as we begin. The first problem is that small religion is the problem. That may not be difficult for us to embrace that truth, that small religion is a problem. The second truth may be more difficult for many of us to admit. And that truth is that all religion is small religion, at least compared to the subject matter. See, as a writer, my life's work is trying to use words to connect with people on the universal parts of being human. But yet when it comes to death or the depth of our grief or the joy of being loved or our anger at injustice, the truth is those words simply fail. They can point to those emotions and experiences, but those words can't contain them. And religion has an even greater challenge. It seeks with words to express the ineffable, to somehow describe that which by definition cannot be described or contained and still be divinity. Religion, or at least religious people and systems, often perpetuate what I would call the myth of figureoutable. The idea that somehow the infinite and the wondrous can be intellectually housed in our heads and we can have a nice, tidy little belief system where there are no mysteries or inconsistencies or incompletes. The beginning premise of this book and of the work I do now is if your faith doesn't make you a more compassionate person, then what is the point of it? Spiritual people should have lives marked by empathy. They should be in communities that are tangible expressions of that empathy. The right religious worldview or the correct belief system is the one that enables you to be more aware of the suffering in the world and propels you into other people's lives to alleviate that suffering. Friends, if your religion doesn't yield an ever-deepening compassion and move you to widen your embrace of disparate humanity, I think you have the wrong religion. Believing the right thing isn't the right thing unless your life shows the fruit. So less generosity, less empathy, less diversity means you've gotten it wrong. Better humans, which I know we're trying to be, are those who understand that humanity is a single interdependent community and that we have a responsibility to one another. So the underlying question as I wrote and as I live now 
is what are the greatest barriers to empathy and how do we remove those barriers to empathy individually, interpersonally, communally, and systemically. So for a little while tonight, I want us to lean into what does a life of pure empathy, as much as we can live with it, how, what does that actually look like? And in the work that I do as a pastor, author, caregiver, people tell me things they don't feel that they can tell anyone else. And that's really good news for you because you live alongside these people. You're in relationships with them. And often, someone will come up to me at an event like this and I'll shake their hand or say hello or we'll give a hug. And within about 30 seconds, they tell me something that is incredibly personal or incredibly painful, something they may never have told anyone else, and they want me to reply. And it's because they want something that they can take back to wherever they live that can help them in the story that they've told me that I don't know very much about. And so here's what I tell them. I want to begin with this idea. I tell them to look for the fears and the false stories. Look for the fears and the false stories around you. Find out what people are afraid of and then figure out why those fears might be misplaced or addressed because no one is at their best when they're terrified. See, when we're in conflict with other people, whether we're debating politics or religion or finances or work problems or parenting issues or strong opinions on any topic, the other person is almost always afraid of something. And that fear drives them and us to hold or defend a certain position. People's fears and their false stories will manifest in the politicians they support, in the religious beliefs they hold in the way they respond to adversity. And part of the job of being loving human beings is trying to uncover people's fears and validate them so that we can do something important, not get them to agree with us and not change everything that they believe, but so they can be less afraid and see the world accurately again. When you, you've carried your fears into this place, and those fears, those false stories, they're handed down to us by the people who raised us. They're taught to us. They're given to us by people who want us to imagine that they're true. We're given our false stories and our fears by pastors and politicians and by partisan media. And some of the false stories are curated by the people in this room. And when you encounter another person's fears, you're slamming right into their backstory to their personal mythology, to a long and very specific history. Sometimes when we're encountering people we disagree with, we're trying to overcome years or even decades of words spoken into their lives. We're sometimes trying to overcome their parents or their pastors or their politicians. Sometimes we're even trying to overcome their idea of God. And I realize that doing this work, sometimes I have to argue with someone else's God, and that's an argument that I'm probably not going to win. So begin to look for the fears and the false stories and try to figure out how you can make people less fearful, not so that they become more like you, but so that they can actually become people who can receive and give love in the way that they should be able to. I was in Minnesota before the pandemic and I was walking through a church lobby and a woman grabbed me by the arm. She said, John, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And she started to cry almost immediately. And she said something that maybe you might have felt recently. She said, John, I hate how angry I am. I'm so angry all the time and I never used to be like that and I really hate that about myself. And I looked at her and I said, you... you probably are angry, but it might be something else. You might be grieving right now. Have you ever stopped to consider that you might be in mourning? And she said, I never thought about that. And she said, actually, now that you said it, that's what it is. I feel like I've lost so much over the past three or four years, and I don't know how to get it back. I don't know why you're here today, but I imagine you're here because you've lost something too. I imagine you're mourning something over the past four or five years. 
I wonder what you're grieving the loss of. Maybe your idea of God or country or family. Maybe you're grieving your belief in the goodness of people. Maybe you're grieving a relationship with someone that you once felt home around. You might, have, you might be grieving your sense of optimism about the future. You might be grieving the lightness that you used to feel when you woke up in the morning. You might be grieving every single one of these things and more that you can't quite name. So anger isn't what you're afflicted with. That's just the symptom of your heart grieving. And what I want you to know tonight and remember is that there are 8 billion funerals going on right now. Every single human being that you pass by and the people you love and the people you agree with and the people you can't stand, they're all living with the collateral damage of being human. They have all lost. And so if we can be cognizant of that grief as we live and move through the world, maybe we can develop a layer of empathy that we don't normally have for people we disagree with. So the fear and the false stories, be aware of the fear. Be mindful of the grief that we all carry. And something else, I want you to be actively confronting the epidemic of loneliness that we have in our world. When the pandemic began, it exacerbated a problem that was already present, right? Disconnection. We know that in general, that pulling away has been happening for a long time even as online community has grown exponentially. In the pandemic, what it did was it, it introduced forced geographic distance in addition to the emotional distance that was already there. And now we have an epidemic of lonely human beings. The reason we go to the movies or read a book or look at artwork or listen to music is to see something of ourselves reflected back to us. We want to feel connected to other people, to find affinity in the experience of being human. And the reason that we express ourselves at all is to make that kind of connection in the opposite direction, to say to the world, here is my story. And knowing we are part of a shared story, that's often what tethers us to hope when difficulty comes. And that shared story is called community, and community is the antidote to the greatest sickness of loneliness. We're, we're always fighting the feeling that we're alone, don't we? In our worries and in our values and in our fears, we always feel like we're the last of an endangered species. That no one feels what we feel or cares about what we care about. Especially when we're surrounded by so much discord, by so much tribalism, by so many opposing opinions. Most of us wade into crowds of strangers every day on social media, hoping to find people who see something that we see, who are outraged by what we're outraged by, someone who is asking a question that we're asking, and ultimately, we want to know, I'm not alone, and I'm not crazy. And if I'm crazy, I'm in really good company. Years ago, I was leading a student gathering. It was my first day, my first official event at a mega church. It was a step up for me. It was like, you know, I was like the Jeffersons. I was moving on up to the, to the east side. And I was in this student gathering, and there were all these young people and their parents and youth leaders, and we're at this massive student center. And I'm doing what I call uh, hummingbirding. So I'm going on, going, how are you tonight? Good to see you. Hi, nice to see you. How I'm just like, just quickly, briefly saying hello to everyone. And I'm talking about some stuff that's going on. And I look at the periphery of the room, and I see that there were two young people standing at the back of the room, kind of with their arms like this. And I saw that as a challenge. <laughs> because my whole life I've been in youth ministry, it's like, you're like a demented storm chaser. You're like, that looks horrible, let's go there. So I go up to these two students and I'm trying to welcome them. I'm talking to them about the events that we're having and about, you know, I have all my youth leader stuff and I'm doing one-liners and they're not giving me anything. And I feel like, okay, I'm dying here. And I try a little bit more to make conversation and ask them some questions and nothing, no responses. So the flop sweat is growing and so I finally just tell them, you know, I hope they have a good time and I walk away thinking I'd failed. And a couple days later, I got an email from the older of the two students who turned out to be brother and sister, and the sister had emailed me. And she said, I don't know if you remember me, but my brother and I were in the back of the room when you came up and you talked to me. And she said, we didn't want to be there, 
We were forced to be there, which is what you want, people under duress. <laughs> a captive audience, the doors are locked, by the way. And she said, we've had a really bad experience with church and with pastors, and she said, but you talk to us and you really seem to care. And she said, I want you to know that it mattered. And she said, you made me feel visible, and I rarely feel visible. There is no greater gift we as agents of compassion and mercy and love and justice can do than make people feel seen. And loneliness is invisibility. And I imagine part of the reason some of you are here tonight is you wanted to be in a community of like-hearted people, right? You wanted to gather with other human beings who care about the world in the way that you do. And I imagine it's a help to know that you have your people, that you are visible. Not long ago, I got to lead a retreat in the mountains, and it was one of the deals like tonight. Like, I had a feeling at this retreat people were going to show up because they had registered and paid. <laughs> so that tends to increase the likelihood that they will follow through. And, but I was still nervous, you know, like you throw a party and is anyone going to show up and I'm pacing around this empty room and finally people start arriving and there's this excitement. People are, are saying hi and they're introducing themselves and hugging and high-fiving and it's really great. And there's all this energy in the room and suddenly, boom, someone walks in the door and she like takes the whole air out of the room. Everyone looks at her and she says, my people. I said, you're in the wrong room. I'm sorry. It's actually down the hall. And she said, I just knew that all of the people in this room, there was enough commonality that I would be welcomed and loved. So we removed her. No. Um, but this is the truth tonight. I bet you felt when you walked in here, you were going to be not with like-minded people, but like-hearted people. That you would have a sense of place in this room, that there were certain givens that were going to be in effect. As we think about the need and the pull for community, this is important because when we understand what motivates us and other people, we can answer the question, how can so many people fall in line with hateful movements or organizations? How can sensible people get wrapped up in movements that are cultic, that are predatory, even to them, that are against their own well-being? How can that happen? How can so many people claim faith in a God of love and yet exist in communities that seem anything but loving? The reason is because the desire for belonging is so great, people will often take that belonging wherever they find it. And one of the goals of loving human beings like us is the genuine desire to make people feel less alone. That's difficult to remember when someone across from you is living in a way that's toxic or hateful or discriminatory. It's really hard to get past that, but to realize that there is someone in there dying to be seen and heard and loved and respected. A life oriented toward empathy acknowledges the universal suffering out there and it makes that suffering central. Something else that's really important is for you to become story learners. So I'll frame it to you like this. Um, if you call your local cable provider to establish service, invariably at some point in time the customer service representative will make you an offer. They will tell you that if you've also like to add internet and phone, they can package those services and they will be much more affordable than if you purchase them separately or from another vendor. This packaging of services is known as what? Bundling. Everybody wants to bundle. Life is better when you bundle. I love bundling because it makes me get stuff for free even though I'm getting overcharged for it. <laughs> and you're looking at someone tonight who has a, a great deal of experience in bundling and I'll tell you why. I recently turned 52 years old, and I'm more than a little embarrassed to admit that it took me far too many of those years to even begin to understand that as a white cisgender heterosexual man who identifies as Christian, that I have the privilege bundle. It was prepaid long before I arrived. I was great-grandfathered in. 
great, great, great grandfathered in. The color of my skin and my gender, my orientation, my profession of faith, my very physicality, all buffered me from many varieties of adversity. They formed a barrier against a great deal of struggle that others experience as routine. They opened doors for me that I never realized had been opened, and they afforded me a vast multitude of advantages, some of which I've become aware of, and others, despite my best efforts, I'll remain oblivious to. I have been, as someone with this privilege bundle, I have been a beneficiary of inequity. But that wasn't the story I would have told you growing up. The first few decades of my life, I lived with a set of assumptions based largely on the specific arrangement of my privilege. For example, I would have told you that anyone who wanted to work hard had the same opportunities to succeed. Even though if my mother were here right now, she'd say he didn't work very hard and he somehow managed to always succeed. <laughs> I would have told you that anyone who wanted to had equal access to education, all while attending a private school that many families couldn't afford, all the while having two parents who were fully engaged in my life and never wanting for a meal or clothes or transportation or well-paid teachers or conditions that allowed me to thrive. Back then I would have told you that everyone who followed the rules and obeyed the law and respected law enforcement would have nothing to fear in a traffic stop. And yet I can distinctly remember being a child in the back of our car when my father was pulled over for speeding in a school zone. And before the officer even got, out of the, got to the window, my dad rolled down the window and said, just give me the effing ticket. And magically, the officer just gave him the effing ticket. So even though so much of my experiential evidence testified loudly in opposition to my working a set of assumptions about the world, I, hold t I held tightly to those stories because I needed those stories to be true. I stayed committed to a narrative that I need to be true because the alternative was to have my world turned upside down. This is the seductive power of any kind of privilege. The more you benefit from a system, the easier it is to defend that system. The greater advantages the status quo provides you, the more tempted you're going to be to resist changes in it. When you've always had the best and most comfortable seat at the table, it's really difficult to imagine there are other people waiting outside. When you are an inequity beneficiary, equity often isn't a priority to you. When you are an inequity beneficiary, you will be naturally oblivious to injustices experienced by those inequity most in danger. That's why you need to be a story learner so you can hear experiences of, of America, of law enforcement, of education, of race that you don't have, that you assume you know. And friends, we're just a product of our stories. And your story can be your greatest teacher if it gets a little help. Because all of our stories have a specific geography, a precise place and time where we find ourselves. It's the neighborhood where we have our assumptions built and our prejudices formed, and our blind spots created. It's also where we build relationships and impact lives and engage the brokenness in the world. And for the past 25 years, my neighborhood has been the church as a pastor, specifically predominantly white churches in the South. Now, our churches were always diverse. All you had to do was ask us. We would tell you, we're a diverse church. <laughs> the website said, hi, we're a diverse church. The bulletin said we're a diverse church. And then when you showed up, you saw that our racial diversity spanned from white to beige and everything in between. <laughs> we all had a desire for diversity, but we did not yet have the knowledge or the, or the ability to do the work, the willingness to do the work, that equity actually requires. Because there is a grieving that takes place, there's a sacrifice that needs to take place. And there was a tension for me as a pastor in realizing that there are fewer entities in America that have been more powerful agents of inequity than the Christian church, along lines of race and gender and sexual orientation and socioeconomic level. Religion, as often as it has bent the moral arc of the universe toward justice, it has moved it away. Better humans who happen to be people of faith aren't afraid to admit this and to speak it and to teach it to our children. 
See, love rejoices with the truth, and that includes the truth of the brokenness of our nation. You feel the divide out there, right? It's not just me. We know we're divided, but the divide isn't the one that we think it is. The divide isn't strictly Republican versus Democrat. It isn't just progressive Christians versus conservative Christians. It's not a black-white divide. It's, it's a story divide. It's a divide in the story that some people tell themselves about who they are and about the world and a different story that other people tell themselves. For example, some people live with an open hand and others with a closed fist. Some people seem to live with a compassionate heart and others lead with a heart that always feels lack or feels need. Some people have a faith that is propelled by love and others have a faith that for a lot of reasons is propelled and driven by fear. There are some people who see that we are one interdependent community and there are some that see America first. And so what we want to do is begin to interact with people in a way that helps them see a different way of living. It's not simply so they can make life better for other people, because that, it's because that is the better life for them as well. I am for people who disagree with me because I want equality for them. I just don't want them to take it away from someone else. But the problem is the fundamental mistake we make in our conflicts with people is thinking that we really know them. Thinking we fully understand what they may think or feel at any given moment. But it's important to realize that we have to understand not just what people think and feel, but why they think and feel that. How did they get there? With every single person we interact with, we're almost always dealing with incomplete information at the time, right? Right? We encounter from some people from a distance on social media where we only see what they choose to share. They're very selective, edited, filtered honesty, and we use that to determine quite a lot about them. And the first step in an empathy-based life is admitting when we're having a disagreement with someone or a disconnection is, I don't know this person as well as I could. And then figuring out how to learn something more in order to solve that relational disconnect. So we had an election in 2016, wasn't great, to say the least. <laughs> but we all started to figure out that things were not going well in our nation and we all began to feel the, the relational fractures. And a lot of us didn't know what to do about it. And one of my friends, her name is Susan, she decided to do something bold and revelatory and yet profoundly simple. She said, I'm going to start inviting people over to my home who are diametrically opposite me theologically and politically. She said, I've invited all of these women to my home uh, every Sunday to play bridge and have lunch. And they don't agree with me on almost anything and I want to learn about them and I want them to learn about me. You're probably thinking, this is going to be a nice story. Not initially, because it didn't go well, as you can imagine. Susan would come up to me every week when she'd see me at church and she'd say, did you see what's going on in the news right now? If you still pray, could you pray for me? Because I'm going to have to deal with that in my dining room this weekend. <laughs> and she said these conversations have been fraught with anger and misunderstandings and they've been uncomfortable and many times people have wanted to walk out. But she said, I've gotten a lot of hope recently and something happened that really changed everything. And she said, we were having, we were talking about the racial divide in our nation and the fractures that we were seeing from the outside as we viewed it. And she said, we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement and the marches and the protests and the counter protests. And she said, as we're talking, one of the women at my table started to cry. And my friend Susan said, why are you crying? And she said, well, I, I just don't know why God made other races. Right? I was really glad I wasn't there that day. Because <laughs> I probably would have made some smart remark, 
like, you know, if Adam and Eve existed, they weren't Caucasian. Or I would have said, the cradle of civilization didn't come with a cracker barrel. <laughs> but luckily, Susan was there, and she's much nicer than me, and she just asked one simple, elemental, beautiful question. She said, tell me more. And the woman said, well, if, we, if God hadn't made other races, then there would be no racial divide, and we would simply be able to all get along and live alongside one another. It's easy to see that perspective and think all sorts of crazy things, but what Susan realized was that this woman across from her was genuinely grieving what she was seeing. It's just she had a really strange narrative for why it existed. I think what she started to find out about this woman was that she wasn't a bad person. She was a good person with a really bad story. And that tends to happen a lot if we really look at people who are the product of a of a toxic theology that they have lived in for decades, or maybe a political affiliation that they were born into, or maybe a way of thinking or a prejudice that they have always known as their default operating system because of the way they were raised, they have a really flawed story. And the challenge is for us to give them a better story than the one that they have. Many Christians were weaned on a bad story. I mean, their God is actually just too small. In many ways, white evangelicalism is built on an inequitable theology. It's built on the fraudulent premise that God is a cisgender white guy who was born in America, raised Christian, and votes Republican. <laughs> if that is your operating system then your religion is going to intentionally or subconsciously perpetuate injustice against those who don't fit those narrow descriptions. It's going to cause the church to resist changes that bring balance. It's going to render people unable to see clearly because seeing clearly would challenge their entire God story. This is where you come in. I was an art student before I entered into, the, I was drafted into ministry. And I remember one Thursday afternoon in art school, we were getting ready to draw a still life. And it's just an ordinary collection of things on a table, and we were getting all our stuff out, getting ready to draw this still life. And the professor said, put everything down and come on up here. And he said, this is just a collection of ordinary objects that people no longer notice or see the beauty in. He said, the goal of the artist is to show them the beauty they no longer see in ordinary things. And he said, the way you do that is you have to become a student of what you draw. He said, you have to feel it and feel whether it's cool or warm, whether it's rough or smooth. You have to pick it up and feel the weight of it and see how the light reflects off of it. He says, once you've studied it and become a student of the thing you draw, then you can show people the beauty that they no longer see. I think if we're going to have a more empathetic world, we have to become a student of other people. We have to realize that they are unique and they're complex, and that we have something to learn about them and from them, no matter who they are. And instead of putting all of our energies into debating or criticizing people, if we can first cultivate curiosity about them, I think we'll stay open to understanding them. Um, this doesn't mean we're going to like them more. When you get someone's story, you may like them less, but you'll see them more clearly as a fully formed, complex human being. And one other thing before we open up the floor for a little bit is I want you to reflect upon how you see the world because you've taken for granted how you see the world. We took, my wife and I have been married 25 years. Her name's Jen. And we took our two children, Noah and Selah, to Universal Studios, Florida, uh, quite a few years ago. And you know how those trips go. You wake up really early and you drive to the airport, and you get on a plane, and you get off the plane, and you get on a bus that takes you to the hotel, and you get on a tram that goes to the park so you can ride a ride that simulates all the things you just did. <laughs> For a lot of money. Well, what we decided, the first thing we were going to do was Shrek 4D. Shrek 4D is a 4D movie, which is basically a 3D movie that what they do is they sit you down and you put on your 3D glasses and they spray you with air and water and your chair moves and it's supposed to be really experiential, makes you feel like you're there. 
right? So we get in, we get these yellow 3D glasses, they usher us in, we sit down quickly, I'm helping my kids, we settle down and the house lights go down and on screen it says, put on your 3D glasses. So I put on my 3D glasses and the, the projection starts and I'm not impressed. It didn't have the clarity that I was hoping for the price point. <laughs> and I looked around and everybody else seemed perfectly fine. And I said, well, of course, their standards are much lower than mine. <laughs> and then I turned to my wife, who can usually mirror my displeasure in these situations. And she was having a great time. So I said, well, who can account for her taste? She married me. <laughs> so I sat through this subpar entertainment experience for about seven minutes. And the house lights went up. And we're getting ready to clear out. My wife looks at me. She goes, what's on the top of your head? And I said, what? And she said, and I said, and I look and I pulled down these yellow 3D glasses and I realized that when I went in, in my haste, I put on my ordinary sunglasses <laughs> and watched the entire movie with ordinary non-prescription sunglasses. <laughs> now, for a lot of reasons, you can imagine my wife is long suffering. <laughs> and I said to her, can we go again? And she said, sure. So we went around, got in the queue, waited in line again. And this time I sat down, put on my 3D glasses, and you know what? It was amazing. <laughs> so realistic. I want you to think about your lenses because the lenses through which we view the world matter. As we live in community alongside people, it's tempting to imagine that everyone sees things the way we do to think that their filters match our own, that we're having a similar experience of the same planet or the same country or the same religion or even the same Jesus. But the truth is, we all have incredibly specific story-shaped lenses that subjectively inform and color and alter life in front of us. You carry yours in with you even as you are watching and listening. This is why spirituality and politics are both so messy and fraught with discord because we've got Eight billion sacred beloved stories all colliding, right? That's a lot of relational friction to sustain, whether we're deeply religious or undecidedly undecided or passionately anti-religion. But for those of us in this room who consider ourselves believers in some capacity, we have a different problem. We all make God either slightly or substantially in our own image. Right? This subjective and self-reverential picture of the divine, it's formed by the homes in which we were raised and the teachers we had and the faith communities we did or didn't grow up in or our individual life experiences, our personality types, even our, our very physicality. Those of us who have engaged Christianity, either directly or peripherally, we all sift the words and life of Jesus for the parts of them that seem to reflect our passions or confirm our prejudices or ratify our politics or echo the story that we tell ourselves. Because of these lenses, they've shaped the gospel stories that we've read and had preached to us. And because of this, we tend to worship a God of confirmation bias. Every person in this room claiming to be a Christian or simply aspiring to the teachings of Jesus has a highly personalized, greatly customized, individually constructed, and ultimately incomplete Jesus. Do you know there are as many Jesuses in this room as there are people claiming to know Jesus? But this is true of every area of our lives, not just the culture war issues. We can't help but read the Gospels so that they skew our way, which is why in the stories that Christians encounter in the Bible, we're almost always... We almost always imagine we're Jesus, or at the very least, we're the earnest, faithful disciples alongside him. We're never the self-righteous religious frauds whose hypocrisy he is condemning. We like to picture ourselves as the good Samaritan, rescuing the wounded man on the roadside and not the callous people walking by. We're always the persecuted woman and never the chastised stone throwers. We're always like Jesus and never like a jerk. And this bias toward ourselves is a huge obstacle because it impacts us greatly if we're serious about living this faith because the image of God is the primary lens through which we view everything. Our relationships and the environment and the church and race and equality and healthcare and politics and parenting. 
And if having a personalized Jesus is difficult for us as we engage people individually, well, what happens when we try to get together in spiritual community and I've got five or 50 or 500 or 5,000 people and we've got to agree on which Jesus we're going to perpetuate in the world? That's why your church meetings are so terrible. <laughs> it's not because you have to talk about plumbing and bake sales. It's because... You have to wrestle with what everyone else sees as the mission of a person who embodies the life of Jesus. So I've been talking for a while, and I, I'd love to have you just share what's on your heart tonight. We're going to pass a microphone, and I'd love for you just to, what's stirring up in your heart, what questions are you having, what encouragements are you getting, or a question about anything not related, because we're never all going to share the same space and time together. And I'd just love to hear what's on your mind. So Reverend Brian is going to get in a cardio workout tonight. Just raise your hand <laughs> when you want to share a response to anything. What are you feeling, thinking, struggling with, encouraged by? I just write, is this on? Um, I'm, my, problem, my problem right now is um, I kind of just don't care anymore. I don't care about meeting new people. I'm afraid to meet new people um, because as my husband and I say, we meet new people and we like them and then they turned out to be zombies. <laughs> That's the only way we can put it. Um, and it's, it's disheartening. So now I, I just, I kind of am afraid to meet new people and, and I just don't care. And family members, we're so divided now that um, I just, I don't care. Like holidays, I didn't want to spend them. I just wanted to be with my own, mm. my daughter, my husband, my son, because it just wasn't worth the drama and the conflict and the, the stress that I would feel with all of it. So, yeah, yeah I'm sure many people here are sharing that this, this apprehension to be around people or a tendency to pull away either from people that we've known and loved or from even meeting new people because we know we're eventually going to reach that point where we say it's like the walking dead. Is, it, is, is that one of them? Um, which, is, which is a terrible way to think, but we understand that that's born out of a, a, the fatigue that we're talking about, right? The grief that we're talking about. We have all been through so much, and when, in my closing time later, I'll talk a little bit about that, but I think what we have to trust in the fact that the people that we encounter and the people we're worried about, they are more, they can't be caricatured. They can't be stereotyped. They can't be summarized even by the things that they believe. And there are times uh, in, in my life, in fact, you're all here. You probably progressed at some point. I bet you don't believe what you used to believe 10 years ago about something, whether it's marriage or equality or gender pay gaps or LGBTQ human beings. You had a moment or a series of moments that allowed you to change. Well, part of what we do is we step into people's lives and they may not see what we see and they might not know what we know and they may not have the story that we've had. But the hope is that we can be part of the transformation of their lives and we don't get to see that result always. So what I would just encourage us all to do is to say, step into the lives of other people and seek to be a reminder about goodness and love and mercy and trust that that'll do a work that you can't anticipate. I was a student pastor for decades and I saw people at 13 and 14. Do you know they're not usually gonna encourage you about how great you're doing? <laughs> And they're also not going to suddenly transform. I wanted them to answer the altar call and have their lives changed and, turn and say, John saved me. But the truth is, I was just part of the story. So we get to show up in people's lives and realize we don't know the backstory and we don't know the story going forward. We just know the here and now. But um, not easy stuff. What are you thinking about? What are you feeling? What are you challenged by? Um, I think the conflict in Ukraine has me so twisted inside as a human being. Um, and I think a lot of it is stemming from the last four years that we went through with um, the president that we had. There's something inside of me like I think it's his fault and we'd never be here if we didn't. And um, it's just a, the horror that is happening there. It, it's just beyond what I can even fathom. Oh, I think what we're seeing right now is, we talked about it, we met with some ministers from the area last night, and 
we talked about the, the grief and, and the accumulation of that. And the, the way that normal grief works is it's an event. You lose someone one time and you spend your whole life processing that, the grief of that event. But what we're experiencing is recurring grief, right? It's a continual mourning there that we, we don't, you know, you're grieving about immigration one day and it's healthcare the next day and there's, there's the racial divide and then there's the political system and then there's what's happening in Ukraine. And so we never get to fully sit with anything and even though you think about the loss of life we've had here over the past few years, and we can't even fully sit with that and mourn that because we've got to move on to the next thing. Now, part of that is by design. Part of that is, is people wanting to wear you out and expire you. Um, but the other part about it is it's just the circumstances we've lived in, and we all need to stop and take some time to assess the damage that this has done to us and the way it's made it difficult for us. Some of you are saying, I have no compassion left to give. And um, part of this night is about us saying, there is a deep res reservoir that you can draw from that you need to. You need to find sustenance and community. You have to find rest, silence, and solitude. You have to recalibrate your heart. You have to take care of your body. You have to play and rest and you have to do all the things so that you can be a fully formed human being and not succumb to how much you care about the world. Uh, I don't want you to become martyrs of your own hearts. I don't want you to be activists and caregivers that expire early. That's not the goal. The goal is you being here for a long time. So um, please hear that tonight. Who else has got some? Look at the front row. It's just all. I'm going to go to the gentleman back here, and then I'll come back. This is the splash zone, by the way, when I'm speaking. <laughs> So I've been thinking about the question you asked when we first started, why are we here? And for me, I discovered you and, and, and you and I were on the same comments often. And it was a time in life when I had, I had lost respect for my friends that were Christians. My friends that were okay with cages and were okay with with the lifestyle of the former president and justifying everything that went with it and was okay with cheating to win elections in a country that's built on not doing that. And, and I'm a guy that believed and, and still believes or, or hopes for America. Uh, you know, I volunteered to go in the military at a young age. I, I, I and suddenly I had just gotten to where everybody that was in my circle. I, I, a lot of them I had to cast off because mm. they were just so hateful. And, and I had become concerned that that was Christianity's future. And then I saw your voice. And I have a friend of mine that, that taught at Concordia, Missouri, and I saw his voice. And so those connections changed me for the better mm -hmm. gave me there there was and then I saw the people that were supporting you and and so when you when you announced the original tour I looked at all the dates and then when Claremont popped up and it's within a few miles of where I live it was like this was meant to be so there was no place else I could be tonight well, thank you Thank you. Thank you for making the long journey here tonight. Uh, no, I'm grateful. And, you know, a couple of things about that. I'm grateful when people say, you know, you've redeemed my hope in Christians. And all, all I do is I'm reflecting my personal beliefs, and those are always in flux, and they're always as ten filled with tension as anyone else's. But I, I like to ask questions and hope that those questions make people feel, feel better and feel more known. And if people, if the words resonate with people, I'm, I'm just so grateful because I just, I, that's just been my, my journey. And the other thing is, you know, I was joking that when people sometimes read my bio, and my bio, and they'll, they'll say, and he has a hundred million blog reads. And then people go, oh my gosh, a hundred million blog reads. And I want you to hear that I don't see that number, which is true, as a validation of how good my writing is. It's a reminder that there are people like you out there 
That's how many people are out there asking the questions you're asking, feeling the burdens that you're feeling, caring about the things you care about. So when you feel alone, realize that that is a false story. You're going to hear the angry people and you're going to hear the messiness, but there are beautiful redemptive acts happening all over the world right now. They're just not going to trend on Twitter. Um, a, a gentleman at one of my talks said, John, I have two news feeds in my life. I have one news feed, it's the news, and it's social media. And if I only look at that news feed, it's going to give me division and hatred and, and divisiveness. He said, but there's another news feed. It's a smaller, closer, it's on the ground where I live. And he says, it's in my neighborhood. And if I look at the people whose names and faces I know, and if I look at that news feed, it's easy to find hope. It's easy not to be despondent. So part of the, the story tonight is doing that. And actually, you should leave here with 10 phone numbers of the people in this room, and you should say, what are we going to do to get to make this world actually more beautiful? Because I'm leaving tomorrow or the day after. <laughs> no. A couple more. A couple more. Well, in addition to all the garbage that was going, has been going on since 2016, my son is gay, and you and Randy Rainbow who I also saw live, have gotten me through. So thank you very much. Oh, I'm so great. Me and Randy Rainbow, that's a that's good company. <laughs> Randy, if you're out there, please call my people. Actually, I'm kidding. I have no people. Just call me. <laughs> thank you. I'm grateful that I've been an encouragement. I'm a 19-year-old college student, and um, it's safe to say that I'm entering adulthood at such a really scary time in this world. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm kind of sick of living through historical events, if I'm being honest, because honestly, with how things are going, I'm really terrified for not only my future, mm. but for my generation's future. Like, how is this going to affect how I live 50 years from now? What is everything going to be like? Mm. And it's scary because... Ev but when we think we have it, it gets turned upside down again. Yeah. Like, I didn't expect to graduate in the midst of a pandemic, nor did I expect to turn 18 in, like, one of the most crucial elections in probably in history. Mm. It's just very scary, and I'm hoping everything gets better, but that can change, too. The yeah. world is always changing. Well, thank you. I, I forgot your name. Uh, Jillian. Jillian. Thank you, Jillian. Um, First of all, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. I'm grateful that you care that deeply. And um, I think if you've got, had time to talk to the stories, of, share the, hear the stories of people in this room even who are older than you, they would probably point to certain times in their lives when there was war and there was poverty and there was depression and people were terrified then. And I'll, I'll, we can look back in history and see civilizations have lived through really, really horrible things and... There have always been people in that place and time to stand for equity and justice and love, even when it wasn't the popular or, you know, easy thing to do. And so that's just what we do. We have no other option. You know, I'm reading the diary of Anne Frank. I read it over and over again. And she's talking as a teenager and she's basically, I'm going to paraphrase, she's saying, the, the, everything is really going wrong, but I still, for some reason, still have hope. And, and I think... How dare I fall asleep on that? How dare I say, I'm going to give up? No, I have to. We have inherited this place and time because of the people who have come before us. And we're going to do our best to leave something for the people after. So I'm just glad you're here because we're in good hands. Um, there's no better time to be a person of empathy than right now because you are desperately needed. Thank you. In, in the back, are you tracking your steps? I hope so. <laughs> I'm just looking for the snack bar. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the incentive structure of our political system does not reward the kind of Christian values and, and, and outreach that you, are, that you are talking about tonight. How would you have us try to address that uh, uh, as best we can? Yeah, the, so the political structure is not set up to be uh, for the compassion or empathetic necessarily, or there's a system that's in place that, that is um, confronting the values that we're talking about. Uh, in some ways, w that is beyond our pay grade. It's, it, I think even if we look at the religious system, it's almost gonna be really hard to change the institutional church in some ways. The way this is gonna work, I think, is in not the big and distant, but in the small and the close. The only thing that we have agency to change 
is who we are. So maybe you run for office and maybe you decide I'm going to do as much as I can within that system to change that system. Or maybe I'm going to start giving to people who are exemplifying the values that are important to me. I think when we start thinking like how can we change those big systems, we can easily become overwhelmed. Um, we, we live in stories and in systems. We live with individuals and then we live with these systemic ills. And we, we want to be thinking about both. But the big and the distant will always overwhelm us. It's about the, the small, doable here and now. So rather than think about the political system, think about the politics, where you are locally, and what I can do to nudge that to a place of greater equity or goodness. Thank you Hi. for being here. I'm new to you. It's my 28th anniversary today, and my husband's followed you for years, so... Oh, Here we are. Thank you. Happy anniversary. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. This is a good place to be. So we moved here from Maryland, D.C. area, and our son and, most importantly, grandchildren moved from Georgia. So brown boys out of Georgia, hallelujah. Um, so I relate with not wanting to meet anybody because I'm like, I'm almost going to trust you, but then you're going to be like the other people that I don't know. Yes. Um, and I've wanted to see justice so bad that I don't watch rated R movies, except there's one that's really violent, and this lady's getting revenge, and it really helped, called Peppermint. It's, it's been my guilty pleasure to get through, to watch justice be enacted mm. in a terrible movie. So apparently- I'm gonna watch that tonight, so thank you. Apparently, it's so, it's so horrible, but um, it helped me in, in the strangest way. Um, the other thing I wanted to say to you, sir, is, when you were speaking, I'm a, I'm a, a wordsmith usually, not right now, uh, um, um, but just watching you and hearing the words and the way you, that you put them together has blessed me. And I saw like musical notes as you're talking, it was like musical notes going up. Oh, and it made me think of, I've heard that Satan had, not relating, Satan had, uh, was made of like musical instruments. So God loved music so much and I think we all love like a beautiful singer but when singers come together and instruments come together there's a harmony that blesses our souls and it can take us back to the place to a memory like that music and it's the thing that most unites us so um, you are anointed and I just want to say thanks happy anniversary to us oh thank you thank you that's, that's so kind, and you know, it's funny that you joke about that movie because I was at an event and there was a couple in the front and I was talking to them and, and the woman said, John, I'm 59 years old. I've been suicidal many times in my life, but I've rarely been homicidal. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, that's all the time we have. Um, <laughs> but the truth is, that's, that's the anger that we all feel because we care so deeply about humanity that we are disturbed internally to the point of sickness when we see it damaged. But I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. Uh, one or two more? Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure how to articulate this. I have a couple of things, though, that I wanted to say sure. that really resonated with me that you said. I've been so angry and I felt I have been so out of character with so much and the grieving narrative that you, you know, mentioned really resonates with me that I, I have been grieving ever since the evening of 2016 on election night. It just felt like something was wrong. The world was upside down. It was just this big shift that I felt truly in my soul. Mm. And ever since then, it's just been a struggle with so much, and even with the church being impacted in a different way, and this is kind of a different point, but I feel that it's scary. I'm scared for the church. I'm scared when I have to say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I'm not that type of Christian, you know? And that's, I guess, I really have to say, I, I when the alternative for people now, it's like, okay, either I'm gonna be a Christian, or you know what, I'm gonna leave the church and become an atheist, because I can't believe in a God that would allow this to happen, that these people are the God 
he's the God that they worship. So right. that's all I want to say. And thank you so much for being here. And you have said so much on the Facebook page that I agree with. And I'm like, I have to show my son. I brought my son tonight with uh, me. I said, <laughs> so, and so thank you so much. Well, thank you. I, thank you for forcing him to be here. Um, <laughs> no, you, no, no, I'm, I'm really, thank you for that. And you know, the truth is, you know, you know, many of you know my story. I've been a Christian pastor for a long time. And I often have difficulty with that title Christian because I know what it now aligns me with in the minds of so many people. And I'm, I'm still asking the question now, is Christianity, not is it true, but is it helpful? Is it a barrier to so many people because of what it's in, intertwined with? And how do I have a faith that, or a life that embodies the teachings of Jesus without being associated with so many other things? And that's the difficult tension that many of you are, are, are living with. Um, yeah. One more down here. And by the way, afterward, I'll wrap us up with some words and then I'll hang out as long as you'd like and we'll take selfies and uh, I've got books and I'd love to see you. I'm here because you're like me. You've left your ancestral religion, Roman Catholic, and, and been on an adventure. I was raised fundamentalist Baptist. Oh, it took wow. me years to recover. But I am a congenital liberal. I can remember disagreeing with my family when I was in second and third grade. I read the entire Bible when I was in sixth grade, and it made me leave the church. Mm. <laughs> I realized Jesus could not be a member of the Wheaton Bible Church. So I went on a quest, and I became an Episcopalian, but it's a little classier and a little prettier, but it has some of the same problems. <laughs> mm, that's uh, I like your comment about what do we fear. Looking at my family, my family was afraid of poor people. <laughs> yeah. Because they demanded people. things. And th they were afraid of uh, liberals and socialists, all people that wanted to help anybody else. Mm. And I was always on the opposite side. Yes. However, as a result of this, I don't have any family. No one ever comes to visit me. Mm. I think it's because they are afraid that I might say something political. <laughs> but I never do. I just have a a stomach ache about what I want to tell them, but I can't. Mm. I really feel I love my family, and they're very, I'm trying to be very kind to them, but they really don't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> this is my uncle, by the way. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah. And what, what is your name, sir? Oh, my name is Paul. Paul. Christensen. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Oh, my middle name is Jerome. He wrote the Bible, the, the, oh. the Vulgate. Well, I, Paul, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. I, um, <laughs> I don't I, know what you can do with it, but. Uh. Well, <laughs> well, but what I, what I think, Paul, is, is we've all, um, many of us in this room, we've had to rethink the tribe that we're going to finish this life with, that we thought we'd have right. a group of friends or family members and we don't, we're going to have different people around us. And the only thing you can do is exemplify, embody the faith that you have and realize that um, Jesus was not always well received and neither will people who try to live the teachings of Jesus. Um, but I'm glad that you are living the way that you're living. So thank you. And let's, well, get, thank you, you, let's you, thank Paul for who I he think, is. I think right, you need so, a sense, you need, just need a sense of humor to survive life. A uh, sense of humor to survive, yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm, I want to respect your time. So I'm only going to, a couple more hours will be wrapped up. Um, <laughs> here's what I know about you. I don't know a lot about your stories. Um, but you're tired, right? Because it's exhausting to give a damn. 
to be a person of compassion in a time and a place when compassion is in such great demand. You wake up every day and you push back against predatory politicians and toxic systems and corrupt legislation and human rights atrocities and acts of war and acts of treason and relatives that you can't understand. The volume and the relentlessness of the threats can wear you out. Have you noticed, Claremont? And you're carrying a lot right now. You're carrying two really heavy things. The first thing you're carrying are the big and distant. You're carrying the systemic ills of the world. You're carrying around institutional racism. You're carrying around hatred of LGBTQ human beings. You're carrying around the disparities of gender and all of these political divides. Those are huge systemic things to carry and those would be heavy enough if that was all you had, but you're carrying around something else. You're carrying around the individual names and faces and lives and stories of people who are impacted by those big systems, right? And so those systemic larger ills and those individual stories, they begin to pile up and they reside in your body. They reside in the headache that you have that never goes away. They reside in your clenched jaw. They reside in your elevated heart rate. They reside in the knot in the pit of your stomach that returns every day when you wake up and you check social media or the news or you look out into your community or you look out into your living room and you see how much compassion is required of you and how little you have left. Whether you're a parent or an activist or a minister or a caregiver or just a human being who cares about the world, you are exhausted right now. Speed and activity tend to mask that, but if you stay still long enough, you reckon with just what these days have been doing to you. And I want you to do that for a minute. I want you to stop long enough and let the fatigue catch up to you because I know how tired you are. I know the people you've lost. I know the difficulty of these days, and I know you wake up every day asking yourself, is it me or has a huge portion of this country lost its mind? I have good and bad news. <laughs> it isn't you. The fact that you see how bad this is, the fact that you are so disturbed by it all means your faculties are intact. It means your mind is fully right. It means your heart is still working properly. It means you still have a soul doing what a soul is required to do. Keep you deeply human and profoundly inhumane times. So if you are tired and you're weary and you're grieving and you're angry, be encouraged. Because that means your humanity is still at work. I wanted to remind you of what's at stake right now before we leave. I wanted to paint the picture of four Marias, four people named Maria. And if I said to you, are four different people named Maria, are they all the same inherent value? And you would all say yes. And I'm gonna tell you that one of those Marias is your aunt. And one of those Marias is a transgender teenager in Missouri. And one of those Marias is a migrant living in Mexico. And another one of those Marias is a Ukrainian father. Now, the question is, are all these Marias of the same inherent value? They are. The problem is, Aunt Maria gets most of our attention. Or our friend Maria gets most of our attention because we want to preserve the relationship. And we want to make peace. And we want to have a comfortable Thanksgiving. And what I want to encourage you is sometimes you have to lose this Maria to live for these Marias. Sometimes you have to represent people in a conversation who would not be represented any other way. And you have to engage the turbulence that's going to come from that. I want my Aunt Maria or my friend Maria from church to stay my friend or my family member for my entire life. But I also want to make sure that more people are seen and heard and loved and respected because of my life. And if that person is the collateral damage of my authenticity and my activism, that's okay. Because in my work as a war correspondent and collector of stories, there are patterns to what people share with me. Especially if they come from historically marginalized people groups. Whether it's transgender teenagers or Muslim activists or migrant fathers or racial justice workers, they never say to me, John, could you be less bold? Could you be less loud? Could you be less confrontational? The pattern is they usually share with me, John, why are so many white Christians so silent right now? 
Why is the only voice of faith I hear this exclusionary, hateful, ugly thing? And that's where some of you get to step in tonight. Whether you're people of faith or not, you get to say, here's what people of faith, morality, and conscience look like in the world. You're on, see, the stuff we've been talking about tonight, it's not politics, it's not religion, it's human beings. It's human beings who need us to spend ourselves on their behalf. So I, a couple of years ago, I was actually in Santa Rosa, uh, and I was speaking at an event. I actually wrote about it in a bigger table. And I was invited to talk about these ideas that we're talking about tonight by my friend Rod. I didn't know him at the time, but he, he had a house in Santa Rosa. And the house that he invited me to is overlooking wine country, and it's all windows. And I got into this house, and it was the kind of house where I didn't feel like I could take off my shoes, you know? I mean, I, I, I couldn't even walk in. I'm just like, I'm not going in there. And then he sat me down, and he had this spare bedroom that he had put together for me. He had books that he purchased that he thought I would like to read. And he had a bag of snacks because he'd been stalking me on social. No, he'd been listening. <laughs> Siri, show me Cheetos. Um, no. He had all the, he'd been looking on social media and reading all the food that I liked, and he bought all that food, and he had it in my room. And then he sat me down in his living room, and it's just this beautiful view, and he said, I'm going to go do some stuff, but you just relax for a while. And I'm in this home that I would never be able to afford. And the view was amazing, and the home was amazing, but that wasn't the true amazing thing. The beautiful part about that was my friend's hospitality. He made me feel home in a place that I'd never been to before. Well, my friend Rod lost his home in the wildfires not long ago, a couple years ago. And the day he lost his home, I called him, and he was telling me the story. He said, John, it was so crazy. We were awakened in the middle of the night, and we had 15 minutes, and we saved what we could, and then we left, and the whole place was gone. And he said this phrase, we saved what we could. This is what I want to leave you with. Um, you can't change every political reality, but you can get involved in the political party races where you are and change something, right? You can't help every LGBTQ young people see their inherent worth, but you can reach some of them. You can't help every church become a more loving community, but you can change the one that you're a part of. You can't help every white person see the reality of their privilege bundle, but you know quite a few that you have access to. So what I want you to do with your voice, with your resources, with your time, with your circle of influence, go into this world so hurting and so broken and save what you can. Now, I wanted to leave you with... Um, this. I'm going to spare you attempting to recreate that story. But I hope that tonight it stretches you from where you are to a place of greater empathy, greater courage, greater love, because this world needs it. But I have been blessed by you and our time together. So thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, brother. John, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Listen to that, a testimony that there are many listening like this that want to hear this. It's not about your writing. Isn't that what I took from that? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm Reverend Brian Gatta Simons. I am the associate pastor for outreach here at Claremont Presbyterian Church, and I am so excited to see you here. I'm so glad you decided to say on your Saturday evening when you could have been comfortably at home uh, maybe it's pajama time. Maybe you've got family coming over, but you decided to be here to hear this message. Claremont Presbyterian Church's adult ed team has been spending the last several years uh, wrestling with 
trying to, to grasp or grapple with this idea of what it means to be progressive Christians, what it means to be an inclusive faith community. And we continue to discover what that might mean for us. And so this, having John here this evening, has just been one opportunity to share with the greater community that this is the hope of Claremont Presbyterian Church. This is the hope of our community. So you may have received, been handed a little flyer, a blue side and then a multicolored side, uh, inviting you to different activities, different ways to continue to engage in this topic, to continue to engage in compassion, continue to engage in a theology and a worship that might be slightly different than what you're used to. Now, John shared a little bit about, you know, you, you, you can only do enough. You can only do this little bit. So I will encourage you to choose one thing to come to <laughs> and hope that I see you there. On your way out, uh, there are two uh, opportunities for you. One is it's been about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, so the facilities again are to your right as you leave. Uh, in the narthex and then on your left uh, we'll be selling uh, several of John's books so you'll want to stop by that table uh, and make sure that he can afford his plane ticket home um, his family desperately wants to see him again uh, and tomorrow morning 10 a.m. we invite you back here uh, for worship uh, to hear John preach the sermon uh, or to join us online on our Facebook uh, page. So make sure that you, you choose something, that you re-engage this topic of compassion, and that you continue to wrestle with this idea of what it means to be uh, progressive and inclusive. What does that God teach us? So thank you again. Let's give John one more round of applause. He's in the narthex, so you got to get louder. Loud, there it is. <laughs> And may you uh, take this as your blessing. May you be a blessing. May you be blessed. May you share in this conversation and this gospel message. Amen? Amen. Have a good night, everybody.